Well, hello and welcome. Thanks for joining this week's panel conversation. I'm really excited that you were able to be here today. Um, my name is Matt Fulton, and I'm the Vice President for National Engagement for an engagement company called, uh, called Polco. We uh, work with communities around engagement and helping them with performance-related issues. And, um, and we've been putting on these sessions really for the purpose of sharing, gathering and sharing ideas on what's working in local governments around the topic of engagement, particularly as we start working towards the American Rescue Plan and uh, some of the ways that communities are identifying uh, needs and priorities and, and um, ways they're gonna be using those resources. Um, uh, engagement is such an important topic in today's world, particularly kind of given the year that we've just come out of. And so the idea behind these conversations is really just to give you a new perspective, provide you an idea that might, something that might work in your community um, and um, uh, just to really share ideas from uh, recognized local government leaders. The way the, uh, the morning is gonna go is um, I will do a quick introduction of the panelists and then we'll queue up the topic and go through three questions that we'll ask each of the panelists. And then following that, we'll see if there's any interaction that they wanna have with each other. And, uh, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, if that sounds fine, we'll, uh, we'll get underway. Let me uh, do some introductions of our panelists. Our first panelist is Evan Michael, who is the assistant to the city manager in Buffalo Grove, Illinois. Evan also has prior experience in other, several other uh, Illinois communities. Uh, during his time with the village of Buffalo Grove, he's worked alongside city staff, vendors, and volunteers, and doing a lot of work around the strategic works and the strategic initiatives that the community has, uh, has focused on, particularly in, the, in, in maintaining and building the quality of life of the community. Um, Evan has a public works or public administration master's degree from the University of Illinois in Chicago. And Evan, uh, thanks for joining us. And I would welcome you to just share a little bit more about yourself. Well, uh, thanks again for having me as well. And thank you so much for all you do with Polco because uh, we've been using you all with the National Resident Survey and your other surveying tools. And they have gone a long way with a lot of our engagement initiatives. Um, I have been all over kind of the Northeastern part of Illinois. Uh, I'm originally from the bustling metropolis of Byron, Illinois. So if any of you know Northeastern Illinois, it is from, you either know us from a nuclear power plant or a drag strip. I've done a lot of work with counties, uh, park districts. So if you've got a, like a unit of local government out in this area, I'm relatively familiar with it. That's great. I uh, really appreciate you uh, spending some time here today. Of course. Happy to introduce our second panelist, uh, PJ Gagahena is uh, currently the Assistant City Manager for the City of Moore Park, California. He's worked previously for major cities in New York and California. He in fact, served as an adjunct professor of political science at El Camino College in Los Angeles. PJ's got a master's degree in uh, public policy and urban planning from Harvard University. And last year, he earned the distinction of becoming the, one of the first accredited economic developers in the state of California. I think that's, that's really fascinating. Yeah. Uh, PJ currently serves on the board of the Municipal Management Association of Southern California and the International Network of Asian Public Administrators. PJ, thanks so much for being here and would love to hear a little bit more about your background. Absolutely, Matt. Uh, thank you again for inviting me. Uh, just like Evan, you know, we've participated and, and had your national community survey through local NRC. Uh, but yeah, just a little bit about me. Uh, just really passionate about public service. Uh, I work for large cities, small cities, uh, economic development, budget, human resources, uh, kind of my specializations. And uh, I always love uh, engaging with residents uh, and, and connecting with the community. And so I think this is just very timely to have this discussion. Thank you for yeah, having thank me. You. Thank you. Tell me, uh, how did you get your economic development certification in California? Yeah, that certification is through the uh, California Association of Local Economic Development. And uh, it was an inaugural class of uh, certified economic developers in the state. And so yeah, you go through a series of uh, uh, programs uh, through uh, economic development focus, best practices and what other cities are doing throughout the state and country. And it's just a, a great background and certification to have, especially for someone who's looking to enter the economic development field or even for someone who's uh, had a lot of experience to sort of learn about the current uh, best practices uh, you know, in economic, economic development. I think that's great. Congratulations on getting that, uh, that recognition. 
happy to introduce our third panelist, uh, Jose Madrigal, who is a city manager in Durango, Colorado. Jose has also served in leadership roles in Texas over his nearly two decades of local government experience. Uh, under his leadership, his organizations have been recognized for transparency, community engagement, innovation, strong financial standing. Um, he's been named to the class of Young Rising Latinos by Latino Leaders Magazine, and he's a graduate of the Senior Executive Institute program at uh, the University of Virginia. Um, <coughs> he has also got a master's in public administration. Um, Jose is an active member with the ICMA uh, Association and the Colorado City County Management Association. Um, one of the interesting things I found in your background, Jose, is that you obtained your Lean Six Sigma Black Belt. Well, congratulations on that, and uh, love to learn how you're using that in your in the role in Durango. Thanks for being here, and would love to have you add a little bit more. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Matt, for the invite. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, it's been a it's been a pleasure uh, going into a transition into being a city manager during COVID. Uh, has really kind of been something that I think will be an interesting talk and discussion as we have forward moving forward in, uh, in our discussions. But uh, looking at some of the things that uh, I've been able to do, just been in Texas, which is most of my life, uh, has been where my career has been based in with cities now ranging from 19,000 all the way to 250,000. So have a lot of wide variety of experience uh, as being a deputy city manager and assistant city manager. Most of my career, I kind of pride myself on having the ability to manage just about every department directly. Uh, that a municipality can do all the way from an airport uh, to uh, water utilities, everything in between. There's only one that's escaped me. It's been an electric utility company. I've not had a chance to uh, manage one of those directly. But uh, other than that, I've really enjoyed my time in municipal government and uh, really enjoying my time here in Colorado and really loving the community of Durango and glad to be on here. Thank you. That's great. Uh, I guess we all should be thankful that we don't, none of us are running a utility along the eastern coast these days. Well, listen, thanks for, jo thanks for joining us, guys. Um, uh, I really appreciate it and uh, really looking forward to this conversation. You know, the topic of today is the value of community engagement under the American Rescue Plan Act. Um, as Jose just mentioned, the, uh, the year that we have all experienced has just totally disrupted our communities, our organizations, uh, even our individual lives. And uh, given this unsettled environment, uh, this is more important than ever to try to maintain that connection with residents so that they still feel that sense of community. They still are actually they are able to feel like they're part of the community and part of the decision-making process. Um, and uh, the pandemic just presented so many challenges to, uh, to everyone for that matter. And um, so the, the purpose of today's conversation is really just to get a sense for how you're handling it and how you're gearing up to be dealing with the American Rescue Plan Act resources that some of that money is, is uh, getting into your communities um, even this week. <clears throat> Sorry, I just had a chat, uh, trouble advancing my, my slide. Um, one way maybe that we can start this conversation is really by taking a look at the, the problem. You know, uh, through our research at Polko, um, we know that about 80% of U.S. adults haven't ever even attended a council meeting. And local government has always had kind of natural barriers for people to get engaged in, uh, in the traditional ways of engagement. So even before COVID started, it was always a challenge. And with all of the things that have been laid on top of it um, because of the pandemic, uh, it just increases the level of challenges and the number of barriers. And so we're really interested in learning about how you are dealing with this particular topic. So here are the three questions that uh, we're going to be asking you today. The first one is, how are you identifying community needs and priorities that are going to be addressed using the American Rescue Plan Act resources? The second is, how does resident input help guide the delivery of public services in the community? And then finally, what strategies and tools are you finding successful for engaging residents in tracking performance in your community? And so what I'd like to do is um, start with you, Evan, and uh, ask you the question, can you talk a little bit about um, um, how Buffalo Grove is identifying your community needs and priorities um, under the ARPA Act? Yeah, so I uh, to answer this question, we need to go back to those bygone days of 2019 in, uh, in early 2020. 
So our village board had really identified as infrastructure modernization and infrastructure improvement as the big need for our community. So they went, there was a great deal of infrastructure work that needed to be done and a large backlog of work that needed to be accomplished to kind of bring everything up to standard. So going, uh, staff crunched a, a bunch of numbers. We put our, you know, our big thinking caps on. We were able to find a funding strategy and put together a bunch of mechanisms to fund infrastructure improvement that didn't involve adding it onto the property tax. So for the first time, the village of Buffalo Grove implemented a local gas tax. We went through and put a fixed facility fee together for water tap on that would have supplement the uh, our water and sewer fund. Uh, we went out for um, a great uh, some twenty four million dollars in bonded money to really shore up the funding mechanism for this infrastructure plan. Uh, we actually at our bond here like our bond meeting with the rating agencies. It was one of those things we're meeting with bond council and they brought up like you heard about this COVID nineteen thing going on in uh, China like. The markets are a little worried about it. And we're like, nah, we don't need to worry about that. That's all the way over there. And it's not going to impact us. Little did we know about two weeks later from that, um, we were having meetings remotely and talking about shutting down Village Hall. So our plans had to change in the dime. So with that, we were really then focused on the unknowns and addressing that in our community. And then we were able to, we made the strategic decision to kind of take that bitter pill first uh, in the 2020 year and do the budget reductions we need to do. We offered a VSI for a lot of our um, senior employees to give them an uh, incentive to retire early and then cut budgets for make 2020 a very, very lean year. Luckily coming out of it, uh, our worst case scenario estimates that we kind of based a lot of our decisions on didn't come, uh, didn't come true. So we, we're a better financial shape than we anticipated. And what we are looking to do with these um, these new funds coming in is to really go back and supplement those dollars that we were funding for infrastructure. So that is the big need we have right now is just using a lot of those federal dollars to continue the work and to augment the work we've been doing for reinvesting in our community when it comes to infrastructure. And it's something that um, our community, we had teed up with our community a great deal that they are very excited about. That they they're seeing, you know, shovels in the ground, dirt moving, new roads being paved, new water and sewer infrastructure being put in, flood control, and all of that. So that is where we are really looking and in investing those dollars in is that infrastructure. Are you spending much time, Evan, with uh, doing anything around the economic development, the businesses in the community? We are doing some as well. That is, we are take we've kind of a, a two tier approach to how we are doing uh, allocating these funds. That we are doing that infrastructure, and then we are doing some reinvestment when it comes to a uh, local business. And that is what uh, we set up a website that we call uh, BG Connect. Uh, sorry, BG Delivers. So that is for it's for all of the local businesses in Buffalo Grove. It's a hosting service where they can go in and have a profile set up about their hours, what they're doing with COVID. So if a resident wants to, you know, shop local, dine local, they have a one-stop shop to go to this website, see what's open with COVID restrictions. They're able to search to see what, you know, with some key features in there. So if they're looking for outdoor dining or delivery or things like that, they're able to refine their search to find what local business meets their needs. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. PJ, can you talk about how Moore Park is identifying your community needs and priorities that you're going to be using your ARPA funds for? Yeah, absolutely, Matt. You know, as part of our uh, strategic planning process, uh, late last year, we worked with Poco and NRC to conduct the city of Moore Park's uh, first national community survey. Uh, you know, we received their support uh, earlier this year and during our city council strategic planning uh, workshop, uh, we definitely use the survey results to kind of help shape and inform what the residents' needs and priorities are in the community. Uh, you know, we found out that our residents rate us very high on quality of life, great places to raise a family, uh, clean, uh, safe. Uh, and we also learned that uh, there's areas that we need to improve on. 
you know, as a community, as it relates to economic development, water resources, uh, access to high-speed internet. Uh, and so we're using this information, um, and unfortunately we have it to help us identify what the needs are uh, as we allocate and, and use uh, and plan for the using the resources from the America Rescue Plan Act. And so uh, specifically as it relates to infrastructure and broadband needs, um, those are definitely things that uh, were high on our residence list and are also things that um, the, the ARP has identified as eligible uses. So uh, that, that's really been a critical component in having National Community Survey uh, sort of uh, inform us of how we use uh, these funds from the American Rescue Plan. Well, that's great to hear. Uh, I'm glad that the, <clears throat> the NCS worked well for, for the community. Um, did, uh, did your strategic plan modify a lot, just kind of given the pandemic impacts, um, just from maybe two years ago to last year? I mean, were there a lot of significant shifts just because of the change in expectations and priorities? Yeah, uh, I, I, somewhat, definitely. Uh, I think the pandemic uh, definitely provided uh, uh, and, and raised different sort of priorities um, with our residents and our businesses. And uh, some of the things that we also identified uh, along with economic development and um, uh, you know, having more housing opportunities for our residents is equity and inclusion. Um, yeah. I think the pandemic also showed us uh, that some of the inequity, right, in terms of uh, uh, the public's access to to health uh, healthcare, uh, also in terms of uh, resources uh, for business assistance programs as it relates to uh, various types of businesses in the community, whether they be low income, minority, immigrant, uh, and so I think that also uh, increased or heightened the awareness um, of our city council and making that a priority. Uh, and as well as uh, increasing engagement with our residents in terms of having more uh, community uh, events uh, and, and cultural and arts activities. Uh, obviously, as things open up, uh, those are things we're definitely going to be prioritizing uh, because our residents provided us that feedback. Yeah, that's great. I'm glad that that's worked well for the community. Well, Jose, can you talk about how Durango has been identifying community needs and priorities to help you through the ARPA um, process? Absolutely. Uh, you know, sometimes timing is everything. And coming in board, coming on board here in uh, September, uh, looking at one of the big things that, that you had mentioned about my career is strategic planning. And developing a strategic plan with the city of Durango was something that we were actually on board doing as I came on around November, December, January, starting that process. So we did get a lot of community engagement through that process when we were looking at a strategic plan. So as we developed our six goals, uh, we were able to really find out exactly what has been um, the main focus or some of the main key themes that have come through in that public uh, perception or that public uh, engagement period. And the big one really is uh, affordability and economic opportunity. And that is something that we've used as a goal that we're really looking to tackle. Um, while a lot of other cities struggled a bit financially uh, with uh, during the COVID time, uh, Durango has seemed to be a, a hot spot for attracting uh, folks to come to our community. Uh, for those that were looking to break away from urban areas, Durango provided that exact special spot. We're out here in Southwest Colorado. We have a lot of restaurants, more restaurants per capita than San Francisco. Uh, we have a lot of outdoor recreational activities. So it really became kind of the, the, uh, the nirvana, if you will, of if you wanted to get away and not have to be around people, Durango was the place to go. So during the summer, uh, we had some of our, our restaurants had some of the best summers they've ever had in their entire history of business. Wow. So we were able to be able to gain some of that with that, though, also came a lot of people moving out to Durango, which is great. Uh, people wanting to move out here. It's become a remote workers uh, paradise, if you will. You're out here in the, the rural type environment, if you if you say, with all the big city amenities, having a commercial airport uh, allowed them to be able to do remote working. So they've come. And what that's actually done for us is it's really skyrocketed already high housing prices. And when we look at, OK, now we have this American rescue uh, funds coming through, what can we use them for? It really looked at looking at that affordability and economic opportunity tying in with diversity and equity inclusion, which is our other goal, one of our six goals as well. Uh, because what we were looking at is those that were really what we call our workforce housing, our police, our police officers, our firefighters, our teachers, those that are working in the restaurants, those are working in the hospitality industry uh, are being severely outpriced of their homes and the ability to live in Durango, specifically because of 
we've become this, you know, really in transit hotspot where people wanting to come and live and enjoy. So it really highlighted two areas that we're looking at uh, putting together plans uh, with using some of this funds to help some of our infrastructure, help some of our housing ability that we can create some workforce housing and attainable housing. And we actually had met with our council about a month and a half ago on the strategic plan, updating them, tying it specifically into these funds that could be available and some of the uses uh, that we had that would help us tackle some of the goals that we're feeling uh, that uh, we're really feeling the pressure on in making sure we connect those. So having that strategic plan, that public input, having those goals really already kind of set apart as these funds coming in, where do we want to go about using them? And the two, the main area really that came across was a, a affordability and economic opportunity uh, of really trying to begin to develop business opportunities uh, here in the community for more multi-generational housing and workforce. Uh, also looking at uh, tackling some of the housing need for those that are becoming unfortunately left behind uh, because of the high cost of living and quality of life that's uh, becoming a reality here in Durango. That's great. Did you notice this last year, uh, and maybe when you were doing your strategic planning process, did you notice any change in the level of engagement during the pandemic? Uh, yes. Uh, well, you know, from what the council has told me that there definitely has been. So seeing as I came in in September, uh, it was a little bit different. But what I have seen is Durango is a very highly educated community. So everyone's really engaged and already having that work, uh, remote work type of uh, what you would call a personalities that are here, uh, those professions that are here, that's obviously technology and being able to do remote work from home kind of tied in really easily with doing Zoom meetings and doing public engagements of that. So we really did see an uptick uh, in our engagement. And as we look at transitioning into in-person, one of the things that the council has really made an important, an important uh, critical component is making it Zoom. Uh, because of that increased public participation that we've had, we want to make sure that that Zoom hybrid uh, is still available because they want to continue to have that uh, higher engaged public input process. What a uh, it's got to be an exciting and vibrant community with so much growth going on and just all the amenities, but it also comes with the challenge that you identified. So it's great to know that or to hear that you're you got a pretty good sense for where your priority needs are as you're heading into ARPA. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's switch on to the second question. And PJ, I'd like to start with you. Can you talk a little bit about how community input influences how residents and businesses needs are met in more part? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, putting sort of my political science professor hat on, you know, <laughs> when I used to teach my students uh, for a better part of eight years, you know, democracy, you know, it, it's fundamental in, in terms of uh, community and public engagement. And, and that's sort of how our democracy runs on and how it works. And, and same thing with local government, uh, community residents uh, and their input uh, really helps drive the policies uh, that that shape uh, you know their lives. Um, and, and so uh, you know when my city manager Troy Brown uh, was hired here in the city of Moore Park, you know uh, you know his priorities were were definitely strategic planning, uh, getting more engaged with the community. Uh, and he, we we value the fact that you know we're a small town community, thirty seven thousand people. Uh, but we still make the time for for the city manager, our city council members, the mayor, you know, personally responding to our residents, to our businesses, visitors, whoever it may be. Um, and what was really critical too for us uh, with the National Community Survey and other surveys we've conducted with our residents and businesses is that, uh, you know, their feedback and how well our service delivery model is working, especially throughout the pandemic, uh, was important for us to make sure that they have access to City Hall, uh, that their permits were still being processed, uh, that developments uh, were still ongoing. And so uh, we prided ourselves in sort of keeping the operations going on various types of platforms aside from in-person since uh, like many cities, uh, uh, you know, uh, our city halls were sort of closed or had limited access at times, but uh, providing that access to the community was really, really important. You know, the National Community Survey was, was critical for us um, because, you know, 90% of our residents rated us very high in how well uh, we're providing services uh, to them. They rated us very high on trash collection, how clean the city is, our recreational classes, and also how safe um, our community was, uh, which is really critical. Uh, we've always prided ourselves as uh, one of the safest cities in the nation. Um, actually, this year we were ranked the third safest city in California by safewise.com. And it's the reason why people uh, are attracted to come to Moore Park. We have a lot of young families moving out here. 
Uh, we're only about uh, you know 20 minutes from the Pacific Ocean, uh, and you can go to the mountains and the beach, uh, uh, you know, within a very very short time frame. Uh, but the fact that we also uh, identified areas uh, of of, uh, of need, such as housing and, and job opportunities, uh, as as key resident priorities, uh, really help shape our strategic planning process and kind of our, our goals and objectives uh, going forward. Jose, did you, uh, I'm sorry, PJ, did you, um, uh, did you experience any shift in the level of engagement <clears throat> over the last year, especially in a virtual world? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, providing access to residents uh, and participating uh, virtually in council meetings or surveys, we definitely saw an uptick there. Uh, but we also uh, realized that there's still members and pockets of our population, again, that are hard to reach, that we still need to work on. And uh, again, as things open up, I think uh, once we are able to interact with them, engage with them in person, that's another tool we can use to uh, help improve participation with the residents and the public. Yeah, thanks. I know that our research has shown that trust in local government actually increased uh, during the pandemic, but I think that's largely in part just because I think municipal governments certainly stood up and uh, and met the needs of what their <laughs> residents were needing. And so uh, I'm sure Mark Park is no, no exception to that. So thank you. Really appreciate it. Jose, can you talk about how community input influences how residents and business needs are met in Durango? Absolutely. I think, you know, one of the first things that uh, really hit us uh, with that was the spike in COVID cases uh, and kind of almost going into a, a lockdown here in uh, December, January uh, that we had here in specifically in Durango. Again, uh, we do have a high tourism economy. And so when that started to happen, right in the middle of what you would call a holiday break where everybody's going skiing and uh, we are really close to purgatory, about 25 minute drive, uh, a lot of our restaurants began to get worried. That's kind of where they uh, were coming into, you know, December comes around, how am I gonna make up this revenue? The revenue we make up in the winter is what gets us through. Uh, so, you know, we immediately went out and engaged and had a town hall meeting with the business leaders and the restaurants and buying everybody in and just having a listening session. Uh, what they were telling us about of what they needed. And so we still had CARES funding uh, back from in that area that we're still in 2020 is around December. We mobilized, we mobilized quickly. Uh, we were able to give out about $800,000 to our businesses uh, through the business relief fund. Uh, we also created a program where we gave them uh, up to three months of credit on their water and sewer and trash bills, uh, because they said that was also something that was uh, something that they needed. And then we were also able to pivot and uh, help them with some of their uh, expand their licenses and you know waiving fees on that side. So being able to have that quick connection and be able to engage and find out what's exactly uh, being their issue uh, has really helped us. And we've been able to listen and be able to to pivot, which I think then turns into the bigger one of your citizen engagement. We had an election in April, and we have five members on our council, and three of the seats were up. Uh, our mayor uh, has was term limited out. Uh, we had another councilor that uh, just didn't want to run again. Uh, his businesses were uh, going really well, so he had other things that he needed to focus on, and we had uh, one of our councilors running for re-election. And I think when you look at being in city management, your biggest public engagement is how's those elections going? Are they contentious? What are they looking at? What are the candidates saying? And we had eight candidates uh, vie for three seats, so we were kind of looking, okay, how's this going? But to the credit, uh, I think, of the council, uh, there were some changes that they had to make, the culture change that they went ahead and moved through seemed to be well received by the community because each of the candidates that were running uh, all stated that they loved and enjoyed where the vision of the council was going. They envisioned, they loved the strategic plan and then none of them were running on this wide range of change, but more of here's how I think I can be a part of this goal and this plan and continue to move the city forward. So when I look at that part of the engagement in April really told us that as a staff, as a council working together, as we put together the strategic plan, we really hit on the six goals uh, that the community was looking at. We had our finger on the pulse, if you will, of the priorities of the community and having a non-contentious election with everyone coming on board and everyone just wanting to continue to further the goals really was that community engagement for us that said, we're doing the right way. We're going on the right path. Yeah, that's great. You know, I um, uh, just that you've got a successful strategic plan in place um, and everybody's kind of unified and moving it forward. Um, if, how would how would you classify engagement as a priority for Durango? Is it is it a is it a uh, integral part of your strategic thinking and and um, the way that you go about business? Absolutely, uh, it's probably if it's not one, it's one A. 
or one B. I mean, we I have done a big, big engagement push, and everything that I've done is I went through the interview process. Uh, one of the things that I heard from the community is they wanted to be engaged. Uh, I probably during my first three months easily met over two, three hundred uh, people or organizations within the community. Some were all at once, but still moving through uh, just to get out there and engage with the community. Um, I've also started a new segment. Uh, it's called Ask the City Manager. Uh, so it's another way of getting questions from the community to come through. I interview some of our directors and uh, within the organization, make it a little more fun than really talking about the city issues. But hey, you know, talking a little bit about some of the complaints or things that we normally hear from their department. If we're looking at community development, you know, in a joking way, tell me why it's so slow to develop here in Durango. And we have a good laugh and we talk about some of those things and really to get to know the directors. And what we're noticing is is that you know, at, at, a, at a rate, I mean, it's not a thousands, but, you know, there's people who are watching and we're starting to see answers being questions being submitted. You know, city manager, can you ask me about this or I have this question? And so really trying to continue that engagement process going. And then also we are starting to put in our feedback loops of our customer feedback uh, for just not only our residents, but our businesses and our visitors, because all three of those groups are very critical in regards to the services we provide. So we're at the very beginning stages of that and implementing it through in our organization. But uh, citizen engagement here is very critical, and we do it in every way that we possibly can. And are always looking at uh, different opportunities. If it's an Ask the City Manager segment, um, if it's uh, some new video that we're putting on Instagram or uh, Facebook, that's going to have a little bit of a different twist than just, hey, come listen. Uh, we're really trying to get them to answer and bring in questions to us. Love that creativity. Um, and I love the fact that you're putting a human face onto a uh, a very important responsibility. And so congratulations on that. That's very cool. Thank you. Evan, can you talk about how community input influences how residents and business needs are met in your community? Got excited and didn't unmute myself. Uh, this has been one of the big pushes that we've had uh, during COVID and while coming out of COVID. So during those initial stages when information was coming up so fast and so rapidly and changing, we made it a village priority to make sure that we were on top of everything and that we would become a trusted source for information in the community for everything regarding rules, regulations about COVID and what's going on. So we would have uh, well, during shutdown, we're all working from home. We would have a morning Zoom meeting and an afternoon Zoom meeting where we would talk about the communication priorities that we would have in the morning and where they were in the afternoon and uh, be able to have a deliverable that got pushed out, if not every day, every other day of what the new rules and regulations are, what the mandates are, and what, indi what individual residents can do. To supplement that, we ended up doing a online survey that we pushed out through social media and especially next door that social media platform is one of our best engagement tools we have because that is where people are engaged in are looking for information so we pushed that out about what people want what more information they want out of it and what more they're looking for us as a community to be doing on this COVID-19 front so that's how we use that information to start tailoring our message and tailoring our programs um, Something similar to that, what we did at, at the beginning of the year was a business visitation program. Then once things started to loosen up, regulations in Illinois started to loosen up and some indoor dining was available. We had our health inspectors go to every restaurant in the village, uh, knock on the door, speak with someone there about what information they need, what we can do to help them, and just put a face with the village, with these businesses to know that if they have questions, uh, this is who you can talk to and give them the information that they need about the new regulations and be able to use the feedback we got from there to start tailoring our message and to tailoring our, uh, our policies. And then when it comes to a lot of the engagement we saw during COVID, it went through the roof on our end. Uh, we found that uh, kind of the necessity of innovation on our end was that having to push all of our public meetings to an online format, uh, we started seeing a lot of new and different faces and voices being involved. So we started streaming, we had our uh, village board meetings on Zoom and through Zoom, we were able to push that to our Facebook Live platform. 
So all of our meetings are being streamed on Facebook Live. And we uh, we had many, many more people watching on Facebook Live than we ever had in council chambers, which was always just, you know, staff and our two beat reporters. We would have individuals from the community uh, being able to post comment, like have a discussion amongst themselves basically about what's going on and seeing uh, how local government works. And actually through that, we found a lot of people become first-time volunteers for village initiatives and finding out information and reaching out to staff about ways they can get involved in ways to help. Also, when it comes to these Zoom meetings, with a lot of the other community groups having their meetings via Zoom, it became a lot easier for staff to do drop-ins for a lot of these, where if there was a specific topic or issue that this community group wanted village input on, instead of having, you know, at a seven o'clock meeting at night in the community for a community group, we need a staff member to stay late for one of those. It becomes a lot easier for them just to hop on Zoom for 15 minutes, provide that information, and then hop back off so they can continue their meeting. So we have found um, kind of forced innovation along those lines about uh, engagements. You know, I'm intrigued, Devin, about the, uh, the kind of the creative way that you went, the personalized way that you went out and knocked on business doors. Um, any big findings that you heard from your businesses that you had then, then put into public policy during COVID or things that you're going to be continuing to do as it relates to your business community? That you can pick from? A lot of it was surrounding in uh, outdoor dining. So we did a big push last summer for a, a kind of revamping our outdoor dining uh, policies, procedures, and permitting. And that was just trying to do stuff as quickly as we can to keep these businesses open, to keep them having a cash flow. And then we were able to get our a lot of feedback through this program about ways we can tweak that process to make it kind of more efficient and ways to kind of better serve the business community and get what we needed done and what they needed done in a more efficient process. Sounds like Buffalo Grove's uh, been doing a lot of great stuff um, in being a kind of the resident needs and business needs and and adjusting as you need to. I mean, this whole thing has kind of taught us how, how important it is to adapt, right? So. We always kind of really prided ourselves on being an agile community and, you know, trying to be innovative and go where the needs are and always kind of be on that cutting edge. And this has really kind of pushed that to the next level for us. Yeah, that's great. Well, congratulations on what you're doing. Jose, can you talk about the strategies and the tools that you're finding successful for engaging residents and, and, and generally tracking your performance? You know, one of the things that uh, has kind of been an interesting part, and I know that they've been a, a they're a, a vendor that probably some other municipalities have used is a Zen City uh, that kind of tracks the social media interactions that are going through within your community on different topics that you set up. Uh, so that is something that uh, we've just implemented uh, probably when I got here around November, uh, October, I think it was October, November. So, uh, which has been really useful because we've had a lot of things that have come up. Uh, if you will, to kind of see what is off cuff on topics that deal with us, whether it's COVID restrictions, uh, whether it was our business relief fund, whether it was on about e-bikes on trails, uh, being able to track those and see kind of what it's positive and negativity uh, of those posts or those reactions are has really helped us kind of really look at the, the performance and how we're doing and things that we're talking about. Again, is it uh, statistically valid? No, but it, it's a good gut check really to take a look and see what are people thinking of uh, on that time. And for us, what I think it really happened, what it's helped us do specifically in times like this is not overreact. And I think sometimes with local governments that can happen really quickly. Uh, something happens, a couple of people start calling in, then you're like, oh my gosh, got to stop. We got to pivot. But when we look at those interactions, you know, and we're able to see it on a social media effort, we're able to see that those 10 that may be really upset about something, there's a hundred that are just fine and normal with it. And maybe there's 20 that are actually supportive of something. So it really helped us uh, in that area and really kind of helped us in that dialogue. Uh, the other part, you know, really that's that's really helped us a lot is we started using social media a little bit more uh, on our hiring. Uh, it's kind of a, I know it's not a new thing for most people who are innovative, but it's really kind of bringing us up to some areas to engage where we haven't really engaged before. And one most specifically is LinkedIn. Uh, we really didn't have a, we didn't have a city of Durango LinkedIn account. Uh, and we're really going through some times where we've had to fill some director positions and that's a, that was a big thing that's really helped us because uh, I've been big on LinkedIn. And so being able to share uh, some of those positions that are open has really helped us engage also 
uh, with the community because what we found out is there's a lot of people within the community obviously as a professional those that are doing their remote work have linkedin accounts and being able to do that has been amazing just to see and how uh, the liking and the engagement of people saying oh that's a great position let me share that with my my group and let me share that with that group so those are two of the things that are just kind of been easy wins uh, really that have helped us track within our within our community of things that we're doing obviously ask the city manager was another one that uh, has really helped on that engagement kind of seeing what those questions are uh, so it's been really a, a great process in trying to figure out some things that may have been some low-lying fruit uh, that we can really get onto one of the other parts that um, we're looking at through uh, our partnership with Zin City on theirs is being able to set up uh, questions that we throw out on our own social media about our strategic plan as we move forward in a year, as we go back and we look at it. Uh, our budget process will start in the summer. So we'll be looking at throwing some things out on our Instagram and our social media posts that are actually asking questions to the citizens of what it is, you know, your priorities in our budget and being able to look at how that's tracking uh, with their social media interactions with their with each other, all public uh, accounts. So we're not hacking it, it's all public information, but it just helps us see, you know, okay, what are people talking about? What are their favorite uh, portions and going through? What are their priorities? So really beginning to use a lot of that technology that we hadn't quite used in some different ways uh, to find out where we're at because we have a really engaged community that's uh, very technologically advanced. And so we're gonna capitalize on that. Do you have, um... In your strategic plan, do you have some performance metrics that guide kind of the future of the community? Uh, absolutely. Uh, it's about seven, eight, nine pages. Uh, we wanted to keep it uh, pretty much, pre keep it as concise as possible, but we definitely have our strategies and our objectives in there. Uh, some that are looking to be completed within this first year, some that are looking to be completed, uh, you know, in, in two to three years with some very uh, attainable goals. Um, most of them really beginning around housing and when we're starting housing plans, having goals of when we're going to put uh, workforce housing on the ground, not just, hey, we're going to work on the strategy, but having goals that say, we know we want to have 100, uh, 100 on the ground by year 2023, you know, and getting things through there. So we definitely have uh, some metrics in here that we're going to track to find out where we're at, uh, do quarterly updates. So we did, uh, got approved in March. So we're due here in June uh, to have our first quarterly update of how we're doing on this strategic plan. And it's been, a, it's been an interesting ride. Uh, with it, because I think uh, as they came in, I said, I'm going to do a strategic plan, and especially in staff. Some of them are, oh, yeah, we've had those done before. I was like, oh, really? And they're like, sure. And then they saw it. And then they're, you know, you get the deer in the headlights look, and then they're starting to get comfortable with it. So it's really cool, even engaging with the staff of now we're moving to the strategic plan. Now we have these six goals, and these are the things we're going to hold each other accountable for has been really awesome in seeing them take it now, make it theirs and own it and say, okay, here's what we're going to do. And here's how we're going to go about it and watch them track. It. It's just been an awesome, uh, awesome thing to see. Yeah, that's great. I can always remember my city manager days. The fun part of a strategic plan is when you start seeing the organization kind of understand what the goals are and what the objectives are and what role they play in it. So uh, yeah, very absolutely. And throwing some things at them uh, that, that kind of challenges them a bit, you know, talking about Lean Six Sigma. Right. Having that black belt and them like, what is that and how does that work? And then, you know, kind of getting a little afraid of, OK, how does this work? And you getting to walk through them and beginning to implement that into our organization. Uh, by the end of the year, we'll have at least three uh, black belts uh, that we'll have within Lean Six Sigma so that the part of that is, is we're going to invest in you to have this training. But you're then responsible for taking it and filtering it down uh, through the organization. And then even talking about Malcolm Baldridge being an examiner and being with Irving when uh, we won the Baldridge Award and talking about some of those things. Uh, it's really fun kind of just sprinkling it in here and there, letting them know like, oh, see, now you're talking about Baldridge. Like, oh, oh, yeah, I guess we are. And getting that feedback loop. So it's it's been great. Yeah. Well, congratulations on all that you're doing. Thank you. Evan, can you talk about the strategies and tools that you're finding successful for engaging residents uh, and tracking your performance? Uh, yeah, we there are two kind of big ones I want to touch on. Uh, one is some of the, some forced innovation we had to do on our end. And another one is some of the work our police department has been doing. So uh, at the begin beginning of COVID, we were looking to do a, before COVID, we were looking to do a resident academy, which was going to be an in-person thing, a uh, set of, you know, educational meetings where we brought people, you know, brought members of the community in, had a small group and, you know, kind of educate them about what goes on in local government. Well, we weren't able to actually meet in person anymore. So we kind of put our heads together and we realized Facebook Live is a great tool for this. So we 
tweaked this program and started broadcasting everything live via Facebook. So it was turned into like a one-on-one interview session where I would uh, meet with a representative of each department where they were able to talk about what they do, uh, what direction their department's going and how they interact with the public. And it was just kind of a completely new innovative way that we did and kind of turn a light on for everybody because there was a, we discovered as a staff in a village that we have a lot of very charismatic, very engaging individuals on our staff who have never had an opportunity to kind of get out there and talk about what they're passionate about. So we would have our guys in our water department who you don't really think about as wanting to be out there talking about it, but they were just on there, like on camera showing, this is how a water meter works. And this is how we do like a water meter change out. And this is what we measure and how everything works. And we had a lot of really great community feedback that we got from this through showing kind of the nuts and bolts and that we wouldn't have been able to do had that same level of impact if we had it just for in-person in a small group. We've also used the same format for a lot of other larger initiatives in the community, whether it was we had an electrical aggregation uh, program, we had some changes to that. So we were able to have our representative from our aggregation uh, group on there to answer a bunch of the frequently asked questions and answer questions live from the community as well, to have that two-way feedback. Uh, the second thing that I want to bring up is that a lot of the work our police department has done, and they have been doing it kind of the old fashioned way of meeting in the community with groups of people. Um, they have always been a very kind of progressive group who want to make sure they meet the needs of the community and be a friendly face for what's going on. So if anything bad happens, the community knows they can trust the police department and they have a human face with it. So in the summer when there were all the uh, protests going on and there was a lot of that, uh, the anti-police sentiment, they were out there kind of showing their faces. And also during, there was a Black Lives uh, Matter rally in our community. They worked with the, uh, the organizers of that to make sure it was safe. And they had a police presence there as well, a very positive police presence there. It was very well received by the community as well. Also, later on, they, when there was the, the rise in the hate crimes in the Asian community, uh, there was a large Asian population in Buffalo Grove. And the police department uh, went to local leaders in the bus- Asian business community as well as civic leaders in the Asian community and met one-on-one with them to find out what their needs are and what's going on and what they're hearing and what them what they can do as a police department to address those resident concerns. And what came out of that was uh, the police department put together a pamphlet on hate crimes and they were able to get it translated into the predominant languages in the community. So that way they were able to hand that out and give out that information and engage residents on that end. So we're able to get a lot of that those positive metrics, not only through um, via Facebook Live when it comes to likes, shares, interactions, but also that human interaction feedback that we get from our community, which is really shown in our uh, National Citizen Survey, where we have our police department consistently ranked very high in a lot of those and all of the metrics that are in that survey. That's great. Congratulations on your resident academy. I think those are great programs and um, kind of creates uh, that support of alumni group in the community. And so it just leads to greater engagement. And, you know, congratulations to your cops as well. Um, law enforcement in such a challenging position right now. So um, glad to hear about how progressive your uh, your, your police department is. Has the, uh, um, your NCS, your National Community Survey results, are you, do you use that much within your strategic plan? That was, so we did it in 2017, and then we are in the process of having our results tabulated for our 2021 right now. So I am looking forward to, in the next 10 days, getting our initial report of how um, things stack up so we can compare the two data. But that 2017, um, the interesting thing that came out of it was there weren't a lot of surprises for us with the resident survey, uh, community survey, because uh, we felt like we had a really good kind of handle on it. So that it gave us a lot of that 
uh, quantitative data to say what our gut was telling us was correct, which was great for not only staff, but for the board, but also showed us areas that we needed to improve on. And one of which was volunteerism and engagement. So that was one of the big kind of strategic initiatives that came out of that. And that is where the idea and the concept of this resident academy came from and a lot of some of the more outreach that we're doing in the community. That's great. Yeah. Um, it's good to know. I'll, I'll be excited to kind of see the shifts in your sentiment in the community when your NCS results come off. So thank you very much. Yeah. DJ, can you talk about the strategies and tools that you're finding successful in Moore Park for, uh, for engaging residents and assessing your performance? Yeah, definitely. You know, I think one of the um, uh, things we pride ourselves here in the city of Moore Park is uh, if you call City Hall, you're going to get a live person to answer that call. You know, it, it's a it's a it's a very small sort of act uh, and sort of uh, you know uh, you know significant you know things we focus on in terms of customer service, but um, it sometimes doesn't happen nowadays uh, when you try to call your your local government. But here we pride ourselves um, answering the phone call with a live person, you're going to talk to somebody. And I think uh, our residents and businesses really appreciate that, uh, being having uh, a person to talk to uh, about their concerns. And so uh, that's one thing I just like, love about the city of Moore Park is, is we have those little things that make such a big difference to people. Uh, you know, one thing I'll, I'll mention is, uh, you know, we had a business ambassador program uh, when COVID hit, uh, you know, due to the pandemic, obviously, Many of our businesses were hurting like in other cities, um, but our business ambassador program was able to sort of go out there in person, uh, talk to businesses, ensure they had, you know, they were, you know, and we were answering their questions about their concerns about public health orders. We saw very high compliance rates, uh, and we also were able to um, keep people safe, you know, in our community in terms of the business owners, their employees, their customers. Uh, and also the key thing about that too is, is we, wrap that around with uh, business surveys um, uh, that, that businesses can complete. So we got their feedback and sort of how well they're doing. Uh, we also initiated an economic development uh, electronic newsletter so that we can communicate regularly with our businesses. Um, and I think many of them very much appreciated uh, that they got sort of up-to-date information and where we're, we were at in terms of our COVID numbers, uh, public health orders that were sort of changing uh, on a regular basis. Uh, so that was key for us uh, and also helped sort of solidify and kind of spread the word about shopping local and dining locally here in the city of Moore Park uh, to help support our businesses. Uh, the other thing was, um, you know, through our general plan update that we're going through right now, uh, which is the first time the city has updated it in about 30 years, uh, you know, we really looked to the community and community leaders to participate in that process. And we're right in the middle of it. Um, it'll be completed uh, uh, later next year, uh, but this is really to provide a vision for our community in the next 50 years and how we grow and develop as a community. And I think leveraging the leaders in our community uh, is something that we learned about uh, through this process is very important uh, to increase participation from our residents and businesses. And having a diverse group of people uh, be part of our general plan advisory council uh, really uh, was very important for, uh, for our community. Uh, and then building really great relationships uh, with our chamber of commerce, our developers, property owners, brokers, realtors throughout this general plan process was very much important. And of course, there were key people uh, that we partnered with uh, during COVID. Uh, and then I'd just like to mention, uh, I know uh, my colleagues here mentioned uh, about social media and, and part of it is about storytelling and I think you know making uh, city hall and and our city council our city manager our city staff uh, sort of put a human face right in front of our residents and businesses and kind of telling the story of our community um, you know one thing uh, that we're hoping to do here at Board Park and what I've done in other communities I've been is really having a great um, sort of community video uh, that you can market and promote, not only for economic development and tourism, but to also, again, humanize um, uh, what we do here uh, and what our community is about. And it's also about highlighting um, our businesses and residents out there. And I think that makes a very compelling uh, type of story 
uh, when we try to increase engagement um, uh, with our residents and, and visitors as well. Yeah, um, congratulations on all that. I, I love that you're bringing up the fact of humanizing local government and, and uh, putting a fun side on to the work that you do. Um, your general plan update, that's no small undertaking. And uh, so um, good luck with that. Have you found pretty good engagement through that program or through that effort? Yeah, yeah. And I think we got a very much a representative group on the advisory council. Um, you know, we are still in the process sort of building those trusts and relationships with our residents to uh, be part of the general plan update. And we're kind of using that as this tool for us to figure out uh, additional ways we can reach uh, residents and, and community members to participate not only in the general plan, but other events and policy decisions that we hope um, uh, we get feedback from our residents from. So it's definitely a, a great opportunity for us to sort of re-examine where we're at and what we need to do going forward. Yeah, that's great. Um, thanks so much. Uh, glad to hear that. <clears throat> Um, just as we're kind of wrapping up, in fact, let me come out of this. Uh, just wanted to provide an opportunity for any of you that are interested just to ask questions of each other or any kind of final thoughts or comments that any of you might have on what we talked about today. You know, one thing I'd, I'd like to share, uh, and I've sort of heard it from, I think, my colleagues here um, from their respective cities and sort of the innovative things that they're doing. And I think, Matt, maybe you're getting to this point, too, is you know, uh, openness and transparency are really critical for, for local government and public service uh, and what we do. Uh, part of it is public perception. You know, uh, does the public feel that they have confidence uh, in, in, in decisions we're making and the services we're providing? Um, uh, and, and, and are we doing it the right way? And I think it's about accessibility. Uh, it's about their uh, transparency. Uh, and I think that's what we talk about, we're talking about today is in terms of why community engagement you know, is so important. I, one of the things I, I learned in one of the ethics classes I, I took is it says public service ethics is not only about doing the right thing, but also about the public's confidence that indeed the right thing has been done. Um, and, and so that's why I think it's so critical um, that we really reach out to our residents and our businesses and uh, really provide them that platform to help shape the decisions we make. Yeah, that's a, that's a great follow-up. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, Jose, Evan, anything to add to that? Uh, no, I mean, I think it's a really good thought. Um, I think sometimes uh, what I've seen here, uh, just because of some parts where you look at the political dynamic, uh, sometimes that right thing is seen in two different lenses and they're very opposite. Uh, so you know, what I always kind of look at is from our side of transparency is just making sure the citizens know why we got there. Um, and I think that's an important part of when I look at transparency for us of, you know, you may not agree with the decision, but this is why we got here. And this is the decisions. Uh, these are the decision steps that we took and the information that led us down to this road. So um, I think it's a it's an interesting time to, to be in uh, specifically for us because we have a city that uh, leans one political direction in a county that we're surrounded that leans in a completely different other direction. Uh, so we do see a lot of those conflicts uh, of where um, a lot of that comes into play. But uh, just other than that, I just want to thank uh, everyone for being here. It was a great uh, topic. I appreciated the ideas and things that were presented. So thank you very much for your time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I'm glad you brought up the transparency and accountability thing. As I've been doing these panels, <clears throat> one of the things I've been hearing more and more um, panelists is just this whole notion about people questioning what to do, uh, particularly in law enforcement, where you get so much community noise going on around civil disturbances or just general stuff and uh, the way public services, police services are doing. And so the notion about having data driven decision making and having the tools and the metrics in place that allows you to really quantify from a resident's perspective, a collective resident's perspective, what really is guiding, um, what are the guiding elements and, and um, things that are, are uh, true in the community, it becomes just that much more important. And uh, so I'm really glad that you brought this. This has been a great conversation. I really appreciate it. I think uh, all of you have really uh, shared uh, just some great practices in the community. I'm really happy to find that your communities are getting to the point of, of uh, 
uh, knowing a good, having a good sense of where your needs are and where your ARPA funds can be allocated to best for the community. I will note, uh, just so you know, we are in the process of putting together an ARPA toolkit that we're going to be making available for communities to kind of help you through that whole ARPA process. So uh, just, just know that that's available if you have any, have any interest. Um, I love the creative ways that you all have kind of addressed engaging with your residents in the Resident Academy for the Business Ambassador Program. Um, and um, um, PJ, just kind of the personalized attention that you provide to residents. Um, all to kind of demonstrate and help build that trust in local government and I'm going to make that connection in the community. So this has been really, really great. I really appreciate the, uh, the conversations that, um, that we've had today and, and appreciate you being here. Um, just kind of a closing, I will follow up with each of you. I'll send you uh, a note kind of sharing information of the other panelists and uh, so that you can connect with each other if you want. We do this, we do this panel conversation every week. So if you know of anybody that might have some interest in participating, by all means, let me know. We get them connected with me. Um, so I'd love to get them programmed and get additional perspectives out to share with others. Um, you'll get your highlight segment of your comment probably within a week. And we just encourage you to share them with, our, with your network so that people who trust your opinions can, um, can benefit from your thoughts as well. Um, and I would welcome any thoughts or any, any um, suggested improvements that we might be able to make in this program. Just to try to do it better. I'm always looking for ways that I can improve the way that I do these panels and um, welcome any thoughts that we have had. So, um, with that, I just want to thank all of you for joining me. Uh, you all are coming from great communities. When I have to, one of the nice things about doing these panel conversations is I get to meet great people every week. So, uh, it's been a really, really positive thing. So, um, thank you very much and I wish you well with everything that you're working on. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Good luck with your hire, Jose. See you later. Bye-bye.